अशतो मद्गमया तमसो मज्योतिर्गमया मृत्योर्मा अमृतंगमया आबिराबीर्मयधी रुद्रजत्ते दक्षिण मुखम ते नमा पाहि नित्यम ते नमा पाहि नित्यम ओम शांति 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 O Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness to light. Lead us from death to immortality. And never more shine in our hearts with your resplendent face. Om peace, peace, peace. So we are very happy again today that Swami Sarva Priyananda Ji will be speaking and the topic is when you know yourself, you know God. Very Vedantic, and Swami is always Vedantic. <laughs> and we all know how he is uh, influencing the mind of many people all over, and really people are coming to the thought, uh, thinking differently, which was Swami Vivekananda's thought, uh, we, we forgot that type of identification and is reminding us all the time in all his talks and lectures. He does not need any introduction. We, we used to call him YouTube Swami. <laughs> <laughs> and now, uh, now his name is enough, so I don't want to say anything, but only his uh, new experience being a fellow from the Harvard Divinity School has added something more to his own dimension of expressing the Vedantic truth. So we sometimes get a glimpse of that through his talks and lectures. So we are very happy to have him here today and this evening. After that, he will have question and answer. So he will uh, he mentally re get ready to put some questions, but very uh, sharp and very pointed so that time is not wasted. I welcome Swami Sarvapriyananda Ji to speak. Good evening and namaste, everybody. I offer my pranams to revered Swami Sarvadevananda Ji Maharaj, other revered monks and nuns who are present here. Namaste and hello to all friends. Many of you I recognize in spite of the masks. <laughs> In, in New York, a small group which comes during the pandemic time and all masked. So after some time, we get, you get to know the masks. <laughs> so once I said, uh, so, so many familiar masks here, masks here today. <laughs> Swami Brahmananda is, is very central to this ashrama. I was reading one of the reminiscences of the early days of the ashram when Swami uh, Prabhavananda Ji had set up this center. And somebody who came to visit, he said that the Swami thinks of himself very much as a second in command. In every room, there's a picture of Swami Brahmananda, his guru, his teacher. And he always feels, Swami Prabhavananda Ji, he always feels that he is doing his guru's work, Swami Brahmananda's work, and he always feels the presence of Swami Brahmananda in this ashram. Swami Brahmananda, of course, was central to the founding and the growth of the entire Ramakrishna movement, and especially the Ramakrishna order of monks. But very few people know that he actually wrote a book. There's a wonderful book written by Swami Prabhavananda Ji about him, Eternal Companion, wonderful book. But that's about him. 
But there is a book that Swami Brahmananda himself wrote, and that is a collected teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. Um, in Bengali, it is this book, Sri Ramakrishna Upadesh, and in English, it's the words of the Master, words of the Master. And uh, in this, he put down the choicest teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. In fact, there's this story in Banaras, when he was writing this book late in the night, and he heard the voice of Sri Ramakrishna saying, this is long after Sri Ramakrishna's Mahasamadhi. So Ami Brahmananda heard the voice of Sri Ramakrishna saying, I didn't quite say it this way, I said it this way. Aww. So you have Sri Ramakrishna looking over his shoulder to see what exactly are you putting down. In. So I say, this is a book, the teachings are spoken by Sri Ramakrishna, compiled by Swami Brahmananda, who was his spiritual son. You know, and proofread and edited by Sri Ramakrishna himself. <laughs> Years ago, I read Swami Ashokanandaji. He said that this book is going to be a spiritual classic in times to come. And in times to come, people will carry it around in their pockets. So after reading that, I've been carrying it around in my pockets, which explains the tattered state of this book. <laughs> so I always carry this wherever I go. Now, what I'll do today, we will read two texts, just the first three points from this book. Just the first three quotes, three teachings from this book. And another text, maybe 5,000 years uh, ago, the uh, Taittiriya Upanishad. We will read them together and see what comes out of it. We are well acquainted with the high devotional teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. But the equally high non-dualistic teachings you see, what will come out when we read this, you'll be surprised to see what are the teachings which Swami Brahmananda picked and chose. And the first thing he says, the second thing he says, the third thing he says, uh, extremely high non-dualistic teachings. So we'll dive into this and read these two texts millennia apart, not just centuries apart, but we'll read them together and you'll see how remarkable they seem to speak to each other across the millennia, across the centuries. In the third point, I'll start with the third point. It's, you know, numbered one, two, three, four, like that. The third teaching is, I'll read the ori original Bengali and then um, translate back into English. The third teaching is, a certain individual said to him, meaning Sri Ramakrishna, asked him. What did he ask? Amar ek kothai gyan hoy, e moto upadesh din. Tell me one thing by which I will be enlightened. You're allowed only one sentence. <laughs> He's clever, because otherwise there's the 1,000 pages of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. <laughs> you can go read that. Well, he says, no, you're limited to one sentence. Akkotha, one thing you tell me. Tini bollen, he, Sri Ramakrishna said, Brahma shutta jagat mitha, eiti dharana karo. He said, Brahman is real, the world is an appearance, the world is false. Contemplate this, assimilate this, dharana is to, to assimilate this teaching. Iha boliya chup koriya rohilen. Having said this, Sri Ramakrishna fell silent. He kept quiet. And there's, interestingly, uh, there's a problem with the English translation. If you look at the words of the master here, <laughs> what they have done is, he said, the Brahman is real, the world is false, um, assimilate this teaching, and then keep quiet. <laughs> Sri Ramakrishna is telling the person to keep quiet after assimilating this teaching, which is not at all what is meant here. It's very clear here. Swami Brahmananda is saying that Sri Ramakrishna fell silent after saying this, which is to emphasize that this is the essential teaching. That's all that there is. If you want it in one sentence, Brahman is real, the world is false. And uh, not even that you are Brahman, that part also he has, he has not even added that. Just Brahman is real, the world is false, assimilate this, and then he fell silent. Then we'll go to the first teaching. So what is Brahman and how do you assimilate this teaching? What do you do actually? 
So what is that reality and how do you realize it and uh, what is the result of it all? That basically covers all of spiritual life and that's what we're going to cover in the next 45, 50 minutes. So the first teaching, I'm going from the third back to the first teaching. The first thing that Swami Brahmananda has recorded here, Manush apna ke chinte parle, Bhagawan ke chinte pare. When you, a human being, a person, knows who he is, you know God. When you know yourself, you know God. How do you know yourself? Ami ke bhalo ru bichar korle dekhte pawa jai. Inquire. Make a thorough inquiry into who am I? Who am I? More in the sense of what am I, actually. Ami bole kono jinish nahi. At the end of the inquiry, what will you find? You won't find there is anything corresponding to I. See, what it means is, every word has a ref uh, it refers to something. When I say bottle, it refers to this thing, bottle. When I say I, what does it refer to? And Sri Ramakrishna says you have to inquire. Why do you have to inquire into the I? And there's a tremendous amount of Vedantic dialectics regarding this. Then somebody will ask, what's the point of this inquiry? I all, first of all, I already know who I am. One. Number two, even if I were to inquire, there's no point. Even if I know who I am, what good does it do me? And then there's pages and pages of discussions and dialectics about this, that you do not really know who you are, first. And second, it does you a tremendous amount of good. There's nothing more valuable than this knowledge to know who you are, and so on. So here, if you inquire thoroughly into what the word I stands for, Bottle, this thing. I, what? He says, you will not find anything. Very Buddhistic. <laughs> and then he says, how do you do it? How do you inquire into the I? And look at the step by step, by step how it is going. No knowledge of Brahman, that's the highest thing. Hold on to that, that's spiritual life. What do you mean by knowledge of Brahman? You have to know yourself. How do you know yourself? He says, inquire, vichar. Inquire into it. How do you inquire? Who am I? What am I? And how do you do that? Hat, pa, rakto, mangsho, ittadi, er konta ami. This is the form of the inquiry. Hands and feet and blood and flesh and you know all of this. What is the I here? When I say bottle, here. I. We will immediately say it's not so difficult, Swami. I here. And Sri Ramakrishna says, okay, here, let's take a look at this here. Flesh and blood and hands and feet and head and bones and, and tissues and organ systems and cells. What? Which one of them corresponds to the word I, just like bottle? And he says, like you peel an onion and you keep peeling it. You're going to cry when you peel it. <laughs> uh, and what do you get? Skin. It's just layer after layer after layer. And there's no core to it. You don't get to an essential thing called an onion. Ah, at last I've got it. I peeled off everything and then got the onion. Nothing. What you refer to as an onion is that layer, multi-layered system of skins of the onion. You find nothing. Similarly, when you inquire into the eye, ami bole kichu you will never, you will know, you won't find anything corresponding to it. If you stop at this point, you get shunyavada buddhism, the madhyamaka buddhism of Nagarjuna. This is a subject in itself. When uh, they say sarvam shunyam, all is void, all is empty. Uh, emptiness is the ultimate reality. Um, what does it actually mean? I just make a comment about it and then pro uh, proceed. Uh, traditionally, many systems have taken it to mean uh, nihilism. That it means nothing. That they are saying that they means Nagarjuna, the Madhyamaka Buddhists, the entirety of modern Tibetan Buddhism, the Dalai Lama, all his followers, they are saying that ultimately nothing exists. Now that's a little unfair. Though many, many ancient um, um, schools of thought in India have charged them with this nihilism. 
nothingness. Um, because first of all, Nagarjuna himself clearly says, that's not what we mean at all. It's not that something ex is existing, not that it is something that does not exist, it's not something that both exists and does not exist, it's not something that does not exist and uh, does not not exist. Chatush koti vinir mukta tattvam shunyata. Emptiness is this fourfold alternatives beyond these, transcending these fourfold alternatives. But what does it mean actually? Uh, either it means no, no there is nothing, or it means that's just another way, a negative way, a particularly clever way of pointing to the same thing, the same Brahman which we are talking about, uh, existence, consciousness, place. And that's what sort of we think they meant. But the uh, issue is not very clear at all. In fact, as the Swami was saying last year, uh, one of the courses that I studied at Harvard University was with the World Authority on Madhyamaka Buddhism by um, Professor Garfield. Um, what is his uh, opinion about what emptiness means, nothingness? Nothingness, according to him, uh, I'll first tell you the terms he uses. Uh, he says what it means is epistemologically it is coherentism and metaphysically anti-foundationalism. <laughs> <laughs> so what does that practically mean? <laughs> he says if you study Madhyamaka, Buddhism, the Buddhism of Nagarjuna, and you get the feeling that you're dropping, endlessly dropping into a bottomless pit, you've got it right. <laughs> there is no end to that, uh, you know, the discovery of emptiness. But he has a point there. What he is pointing to, if that is the teaching of Nagarjuna, it is something like this. You inquire into the essential nature of the self, of I, and you find there is nothing in there. And we as Hindus will immediately say, yes, yes, but I know, go one step forward and there is pure consciousness or Brahman. But you know, let's not be impatient. One thing I noticed, um, if you stop there, that endless dropping into a bottomless pit, if, you, if that's, it, that's the uh, state you're going to hold on to, that also works actually. It dissolves the, uh, the kind of thinking which says that the self is a thing. That is dissolved. And that can lead to freedom. Why not? And Sri Ramakrishna sort of supports it. When um, Narendra Nath has visited both Gaya and come back and they're discussing Buddhism in front of Sri Ramakrishna, and somebody says the Buddha was an atheist, Gnostic, in the sense of atheism, Gnostic, in the sense of ultimate reality does not exist. Sri Ramakrishna immediately objected. He said, Gnostic cano habigo. Why, why should it be Gnostic? He could not express what he found in language. And then, that's the thing which is often quoted, then he said something which Professor Arindam Chakravarti recently pointed out to me. That is a very startling comment that Sri Ramakrishna makes. He says in Bengali, Osti nastir maje jeta, tai thik thik. That which is between isness and not, is and not, uh, and is not. Between is and is not. That's exactly it. But what's so startling about this? If he had said it is beyond is and beyond isness, ostinastir pare, beyond is and beyond isness, that's a very Vedantic way of formulating it. But Sri Ramakrishna uses a very odd usage of words for a, a Hindu spiritual teacher. In between, majhe, but it is exactly the language used by the Buddhists. Madhyama pratipat, this is the middle way, middle way between eternalism and nihilism, uh, between is and is not. And you stop there, that's very Buddhistic. Anyway, all of this is to underline the fact that if you stop at this point, it's uh, very much what uh, Tibetan Lama would agree with. But he doesn't stop here. He goes one step further. If you investigate, you will find nothing corresponding to the I. Sheshe jathake tai atma chaitanno. What remains is the Atman, pure consciousness. When the I-ness of the I is lost, the objective ego part of the I is transcended, then you realize God. Okay, so this is the Advaitic position. What is the other text I was going to talk about? It is the Taittiriya Upanishad. 
in the Brahmananda Valli, the second chapter, second uh, section of the Taittiriya Upanishad, it starts with a dramatic declaration. One tiny sentence, short sentence, which I think inca encapsulates the entirety of Advaita, Advaita Vedanta. Brahma Vidapno Tiparam, the knower of Brahman attains the highest. And then next, Tadesha Bhukta, there is a verse about this. Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma, Brahman is infinite existence consciousness. Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma, Brahman is existence consciousness without limit. Yo Veda Nihitam Guhayam Parame Vyoman So Ashnute Saravan Kaman Saha Brahmana Vipaschiteti. How do you realize this? One who realizes this in the, in the intellect, in the sacred space, uh, in the cave of the intellect, um, basically as consciousness, as I am that Brahman, when you realize that I am Brahman, you attain the, the whatever you desire, all desires are fulfilled. You attain complete fulfillment. In identity with Brahman, which is pure consciousness, one attains total fulfillment fulfillment of all that one, one could want. So this is the section there. And you see how it uh, matches. In one sentence, you realize Brahman. And how do you realize that? In, according to the Taittiriya Upanishad, within yourself as I am Brahman. And um, Sri Ramakrishna says, how do you realize that? You'll have to realize it as when you realize yourself, when you know yourself, you will know Brahman. But how do we know oneself? Uh, how do I know myself? What is the process? So that's what we will, the bulk of our investigation will be there. What is the actual process of investigating into ourselves, which Sri Ramakrishna has just indicated here? Take a look at yourself. When you say, I, what does it refer to? Refer to this, it refers to this. And what is this? You take a, you analyze it. Which one of this or which combination of things here is the I? So the Taittiriya Upanishad in the Brahmananda Valli gives us a step-by-step -step, um, description of the process of inquiry. You know, when you say, the knower of Brahman attains the highest, immediately you have these three questions. What is this Brahman? And that is answered. Brahman is infinite existence consciousness. How do I know this Brahman? That's the second question we have. And that's what we'll take a look at. And the third question we'll have, of course, attains the highest. What do you mean by the highest? And that's also mentioned here. You, you are completely fulfilled. You attain <coughs> complete fulfillment, transcend all desires. It's the most precious thing one could have in life. It is the point of all of life. It is, it is the meaning and purpose and goal of life, basically, to realize this thing. Now, what remains before us is the main subject today is the process of inquiry. Can we go step by step into this and see for ourselves? As Sri Ramakrishna says, which are, inquire into it and see for yourself. What am I? And then we'll see the same results. Taittiriya Upanishad comes to that. By inquiry we find there's nothing corresponding to the I and yet beyond that. When we go through this, the process always is uh, that first listen carefully what was said. That's absolutely essential. Uh, it's, it's no good that after the teaching, what, what, uh, I know I've got many opinions here. He said this, he said, uh, I, I think this works, or this was great. But what did he actually say? Oh, that I don't remember. <laughs> that can often happen. So we have to be very careful about what is the teaching, first. Second, do I get it? Or, do it's, or is it confusing? Is that, are there sides to it, aspects to it, which I don't understand? So second question is, do I get it? And the third question is, is it real for me? So all of these three, you must check mentally. Every time we go through a step, you must check mentally. What did he say? Did I get it? And third, is it real? Is it a fact for me? If you can keep saying yes, yes, yes to all three, till the very end, you'll be enlightened before this class is over. <laughs> um, but even if not, the, what we get, get out of this is very, very valuable. At least from our perspective, it is the, the essence of spiritual life. There is nothing higher than this. There's more than this. And you know, the peak of the Everest is the highest point in the, in the Himalayas. But the peak is not the only thing. There are beautiful valleys and there are many places to see. But in spiritual life, this is the, the ultimate, the highest, and the final realization.
and it is enough. It is enough for attaining uh, enlightenment and freedom. All right, so what is the process? How do I realize? And the Upanishad says, um, you, what do you think about yourself when you say, I, what comes to mind? We say this. And the Upanishad says, fine, let's start there. The Upanishad calls this the Annamaya Atma, the self made of food. Why the self? Because I think I am this. So I am this thing, this is the self. And this self is made of food. Annamaya means a transformation of food. What we eat and drink and assimilate and that's transformed into this, this body. Uh, I keep remembering this uh, uh, Italian actress uh, in the 1960s, I think. Here in Hollywood, she was asked, uh, what's the secret of your beauty? And she would say, oh, this, it's pasta. It's <laughs> and she was right. It's a transformation of food. Yeah, Sophia Lauren, right? <laughs> Sophia Lauren, yeah, right. I keep forgetting her name. Sophia Lauren said, it's pasta. So this is I. I am this. And the Upanishad says, investigate. How do you investigate? If you take a, a closer look, this is continuously changing. From babyhood to childhood to teenage to middle age to old age, and then it dies. From birth to death, multiple changes, six-fold changes are there. You're born and you come into being and you grow and develop, you mature, and the body begins to deteriorate and decay and finally dies. Multiple changes, six-fold changes it undergoes. And I have the sense of being the same person. I was this one who was in the, the baby body, in the teenage body, in the young person's body, in the middle-aged person's body, in the old person's body. I am the same person. I have a sense of identity across changes in the body. We say, oh no, you're playing with words, Swami, I'm all of that. But if you look carefully, it can't be true. If two things are very different, uh, B and C are very different, then how can A be both B and C? If A is identical with B and when B changes and becomes C, then A can't remain the same and still be C. I mean, I'm putting it in abstract terms. One sadhu in Uttarakhand, in, in the Himalayas, he said, somebody said, oh, but all of this, I am this entire thing. From childhood to old age, I am this entire body. I, I'm the young person also and the old person also. Um, you know, the mind also changes. It's sometimes happy, sometimes sad. It's, yes, but it's the same thing. I am also, and the one who is sad, I'm the one who's uh, happy. And the monk replied, how is that possible? In Hindi he said, ha, may ghoda bhi or gadha bhi. I'm the horse also and the, and the ass also, <laughs> the donkey. If the two things, logically, it can't be the same. If they are radically changing, then you can't re remain. One of the two has to be false. Either I am the changing body and therefore I am not a unitary a continuous thing. Then my intuition that I am one person has to be false. Or it is true that I am the same person, but I am not literally, then that can, I cannot literally be the changing body. Because I am, the body is changing and I have this strong intuition of being an unchanging uh, person. Uh, I cannot be the same, literally be the same as the body. And the body is changing continuously. Um, this in Sanskrit you put it in this way Savikara Nirvikara Savikara with change Vikara means change, modification Nirvikara without change the, the two cannot be the same I cannot be the body, why? Uh, Savikara Tvat because it is changing a little more subtle and I think more convincing the body is a thing uh, uh, it's an object and I am the experiencer of the object. The seer and the seen cannot be the same thing. Drashta and drishya. You are the drashta, and this is drishya. You're looking at this, bo this bottle. You are seeing this bottle. The eyes see this bottle. The eyes and the bottle cannot be the same thing. Um, it's a simple point, but it's worth noticing that the eyes can only see things which are different from the eyes. It has to be at a certain distance. The only thing that the eyes cannot see are the eyes themselves. So the drashta and drishya, the seer and the seen, the experiencer and the experience, the subject and the object, they are not the same. They are not the same. The subject is different from the object. Um, subject and object are not the same. The body is clearly an object. Can you see the body? Yes. 
Can you touch the body? Yes. Touch, taste, see, hear, smell. Every sense organ operates on the body. The body is an object to every one of your own sense organs. So it's an object. If it's an object, it must be different from you, the experiencer. So I, the experiencer of the body, I, the subject experiencing the body as an object, I must be different from the body. Drishyatvat, because it's an object of experience. I cannot be the body. Again, another. There are multiple ways of arguing this out. I'm going to take only three. The third one is um, jaratvat, because it's insentient. Whenever I think of myself, whenever we think of ourselves, we always think of ourselves as aware, as knowing subjects. Always notice. You say, no, I'm not aware. Then you are aware of, not, of being not aware. You are always aware of something. Uh, so I am always the, the one which is aware, and I am aware of certain things. So I use this just now to say I am the knower and the body is the known. But it also means another point, that I am aware and the body is not aware. See, how does that work? Very simple. There is this psychologist in New York who is very influenced by Vedanta, Greg Good. He's written some books about um, you know, Vedanta as the direct path. And I spoke with him, I, I corresponded with him, and he said that he started off in his Vedantic inquiries because he was inspired by Swami Adishwaranda in New York. Um, he gives this example. If you look at the body, take a look at the hand. What's the feeling? You feel that I am aware of the hand. You don't feel that a hand is aware of me. You know, Hello, Swami, long time no see. No. <laughs> The hand is not aware of it. You just check your own feelings, the experience. Check with your experience. I am aware of this thing. So I am aware. This thing is not aware of me. So this is not aware. I am Chaitana. This is Jara. In Sanskrit, Jara. Therefore, I cannot be this thing. Because conscious and not conscious are not the same thing. They cannot be. So we have got three reasons, three arguments, three ways of seeing. I am not the body. Why? He said, uh, it is because savikaratvat. It is subject to change. I am not. It is drishya, drishyatvat. It is an object of experience. I am the subject. It's known. I am the knower. And because jaratvat, it is insentient. I am sentient. I am conscious. I am aware. It is not conscious or aware. Now, you might say the body is conscious. Body is full of awareness. Yes, that's a different subject matter. You know, in Vedanta we say consciousness reflected in the mind is the reflected consciousness, chidabhasa. From there it comes to, from the mind it comes to the brain and the nervous system. And so the living body uh, is, it feels full of awareness as long as life is there. So there's a whole system of how awareness sort of is borrowed by the mind-body system. But that's a different subject. But I essentially am aware and the body in itself is not aware. Because of these reasons, I cannot be the body. Savikaratvat, jarat, no, drishyatvat, jaratvat. I am not the body. I am, I have the intuitive feeling of not being subject to change. I have the intuitive feeling of being uh, an, a knower, drashta, seer. And I have the intuitive feeling of being aware all the time. Therefore, I'm not the body. Body, the annamaya in Sanskrit, the food body, the food self, is not me. This is the conclusion we have come to. So Vedanta will say, if it is not me, where are you then? And we can take an intuitive look at your experience. Yeah, I feel I'm somewhere in there. All right, I sort of get the, I understand, begin to understand why you would say I'm not the body. But I cannot say that I'm not really related to the body. It has nothing to do with me. It seems to be very intimately connected to me. I'm somewhere in there. If you're in there, that's why Vedanta says, you can treat the body, which is now no longer the self. It is no longer you. But you can treat it, because you feel you're in there, you can treat it as a sheath, as a covering, as something that encloses you, sort of. It does not enclose you in, but let's treat it like that. That's why it's called a kosha. Kosha means? Achadaka, it covers, in Sanskrit means a covering. It covers you. The real you is somewhere in there, and it covers you. The Annamaya Atma, the food self, is now called Annamaya Kosha, the food sheath covering. Then what is the self? 
Upanishad says, ah, so you, are, you agree with us that uh, we have come to this conclusion, this mutual understanding that the body is not the self? Yes, yes. And you feel the self is somewhere in there? Yes. Anyuantaratma pranamaya. The self is anya. It is other than the body. Where? In there. Why in there? You, feel, you say it. I'm not saying it. The Upanishad says it. It's what you who are saying that you feel you're in there. So you're in there. And an antaratma. It's the inner, inner to the physical body. By inner, I don't mean physically inner. Because physically, if you start probing like a doctor, what will you find in the body? More body. <laughs> Flesh and blood and bones and, and so on, fluids. So inner means inner in a physiological sense. The subtler functions which keep the body alive. Yeah. The subtler functions which keep this body going, the vital functions, the vital, the vital self, pranic self. Anyuantaratma uh, pranamaya. And the most evident clue about this is breath. Breath in itself is just a part of prana, but it's the most evident thing we feel. But are you life? Are you physiological processes in this body? Is that what you are? Is that what the self is? Immediately I apply those criterion. Does it change? You bet it does. In breath, out breath. Healthy, sick, hungry, full. Energetic, tired. These are all manifestations of prana. The surging and ebbing of the pranic tidal waves in the body. So. I am the one who was healthy. I am the same person who, uh, who feels sick now, and the same person who recovers after treatment. I am the one who was feeling hungry after a uh, full meal. I am the one who feels satiated. Then which one am I? The changing prana and I, the unchanging one, I cannot be the same thing. Savikara, the prana is subject to change, continuous change. change. And again, is uh, the prana something observable? Are you the observer of the prana? Well, you better be. The entire mindfulness industry depends on that. Yeah? <laughs> Breathe in and be aware of your breathing in and f uh, count one when the in-breath goes in. Uh, does that sound familiar? <laughs> and breathe out. Uh, it's a huge industry all over the United States right now, mindfulness. And it's a wonderful practice. But what Vedanta will take away from that is, aha, so you can observe the breath. And with the, your m m mindfulness meditation master will tell you, observe the breath. And therefore, Vedanta will say, the breath is drishya, object of your awareness. You are aware of the breath. Is the breath aware of you? When you breathe in, we meet again, <laughs> breath says to you, no, not at all. <laughs> breath is completely oblivious of you or anything else or even of itself. It, is, it does not know anything. You know it. Therefore, the breath is an object. You are the witness of that object. You are the experiencer. The breath is the experienced. You are the subject. The breath is an object. Prana is an object which is experienced. Therefore, I cannot be the prana. I am the experiencer, not the experienced. I am the subject and not the object. And is the prana aware? It just follows. The prana is not aware. I am aware of the prana. Look, these are two subtle things. Drishyatvat and Jaratvat. There are two related things, but they are different. Uh, one is, it's an object of, uh, uh, and I am the subject. The other one is, it is not aware, I am aware. So I am aware of the breath. The breath is not at all aware of me, or anything else. I am conscious, the breath is not conscious. Therefore, I cannot be the breath. I, the unchanging, I, the subject, the seer, I, the conscious, the, uh, the aware uh, experiencer, I cannot be the breath, which is changing, which is uh, an object, which is not conscious, or not sentient. For I am not the pranamaya, I am not the physiological processes. The breath just sort of is a placeholder for all the physiological processes going on in the body. I am none of it, not the life processes. They are there, I'm aware of them, this going on, and very good that they're going on, but uh, I am not the breath. I am not the breath. I am not prana. Therefore, prana is not the self. You can't call it the atma anymore. So where are you? Well, I'm sort of inwards to the prana, because I experience the prana. 
The prana is some, something sort of out there for me. Not only the physical body, the pranic body is also, it's a body, it's a sheath. Prana maya kosha, not, the, not an atma, not the self. Then where are you? Anyantara atma manomaya. The self is not the prana. It is separate, anya. And where is it? Antara. Subtler than inward to the prana, subtler than the prana. Inward in the sense of subtler, not physically inward. Subtler than the prana, what is subtler than the prana? The mind, thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories, desires, all of that which is going on now, which is um, considering the prana, all of that, it, it, it's the mind. That's where all the sense organs dump their input. You know, uh, vision and sound and smell and taste, all of that is registered, is transformed into vrittis, movements in the mind. I see, I hear, I smell, I taste, I, t um, I um, touch. Um, mind. So I am the mind, and at this point, most people stop. This is where people think, I am this thing. No, this I, am. I am a mind in a body. That's what most of us, we think that way. We say, yeah, yeah, I am not the breath. I am certainly not a piece of flesh and blood. But it's there, a living body. I am a mind encased in a living body. And therefore, as long as the mind is there, I am there. I am this person. And what is the person? What's the person made of? Essentially a mind, but I guess the mind has to be in a living body, otherwise the mind wouldn't exist. So that's what we think. That's the common sense understanding of a person today. But let's again be very philosophical. Let's give no quarter. Let's be very firm and insist. Is the mind changing? You say, oh boy, does it change. <laughs> much more than the prana, much more than the physical body. Thousands and thousands of thoughts, feelings, emotions streaming through uncontrollably throughout the day. And even in sleep, in dreams, the mind is continuously changing. Which section, which slice of the mind are you? All of it. But it's, all of it is not the same thing, it's changing continuously. Is it, uh, are you aware of the mind? Can you know the mind? Yes, if you think about it, we can. If there's pain, if there is unhappiness, who knows it except me? I am the one who's unhappy. I am the one who's happy. I am the one who's uh, remembering things. I am the one who feels I can't remember. It's on the tip of my tongue, uh, but I can't remember. I am the one who wants things. I am the one who is angry, miserable. I am the one who is uh, happy and delighted. All of these are in the mind. So therefore, I know what's there going on in my mind. I am the first to know. But then Vedanta, what it takes away from there is, then the mind, you know the mind. The mind is known. It is drishya. You are the drashta. You are the knower of your mind. We know our minds and therefore we are the knower of the mind and knower and known, known must be different. Drashta and drishya must be different. They cannot be the same thing. Therefore, and one more thing, conscious and not conscious. This is the most stunning thing in uh, Vedanta. This is where Vedanta parts ways with um, modern neuroscience. Till now in consciousness studies, it's basically, it's sort of, a uh, standard to treat mind and consciousness as the same thing, sort of interchangeable. If you ask in consciousness studies, what is it that you study in consciousness studies? Oh, we study consciousness events. What are consciousness events? Thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas. Vedanta will say, but is a thought conscious? Say, what a strange question. Nobody even asks this in consciousness studies. I introduced this, um, you know, this concept in, in, the, in class a couple of times at Harvard. They were puzzled. You know, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and there, yet, I saw in many of the readings, we did a, a survey of the standard literature on consciousness studies and the philosophy of mind. And I saw that in many of the readings, the tangles they get into uh, can often be untangled if you make a clear distinction between consciousness and mind. That they don't. How would you distinguish between consciousness and mind? Very simple, very elegant cutting tool, a knife which cuts consciousness and mind apart. What is that? That's what we use in Vedanta, not even Vedanta. We go back to Sankhya, they've done it, I mean, it's basically their intellectual property, a distinction between consciousness and uh, mind. What is that, how do you distinguish? That which you are aware of is not consciousness. 
That which is aware is consciousness. So can you speak of, if you can speak of something as this, then it is not consciousness. This bottle, not consciousness, it's an object. This hand, not consciousness, it's an object. This breath, not consciousness, it's an object. This thought, this feeling, this memory, this, 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 not consciousness. Those are also objects. They are called sukshma, subtle objects. This is a gross or physical object. And that's a, this is also a physical object, but that's a subtle object. But still an object, that's the point. It is drishyam, drishyam means object. And the consciousness, you are aware of it. You are the consciousness who is aware of the mind. Then, then you, the self, you cannot be the mind. And the mind is not conscious, the mind is an object of awareness, the mind is continuously changing. Um, you know, jaratvat, drishyatvat, savikaratvat, not mind. Mind is not the self. We are on very subtle grounds now, going inward from there. Then what is the self? Anyantaratma vijnanamaya. Taitiri Upanishad says, go subtler, deeper, inside. Anya, other than the mind, other than the physical body, other than the pranic body, other than the mind, which is now a body. We call it Manomaya Kosha. It's a sheath which covers you. It begins to feel like those Russian nesting dolls, you know. <laughs> But we'll see, ultimately, it's not like a Russian nesting doll. It's more like the onion Sri Ramakrishna talks about. <laughs> um, then it is uh, not the mind also. Then what is it? So what in Vedanta, what we do is, you make a distinction within the mind itself, you make a distinction between the faculty of understanding, buddhi. We call it vijnana, understanding. What is understanding? Just that determinative faculty. When you know the, the feeling you get when you crack a mathematical problem, when you understand a problem for the first time, or the feeling you get when you do not understand something. What's going on there? That is the, the buddhi or the intellect, the vijnana, vijnana maya working away at. So that, for example, right now, what we are using to uh, do all this, that is the vijnanamaya, the buddhi, the intellect. That intellect which understands the mind and through the mind experiences the prana and the body and through the living body experiences the world, that intellect, I am that, and most people would really, really say, do please stop here, that's it. That's who I am. I am this intelligence operating through a body-mind complex. Yeah, that's what we think of ourselves mostly. I'm an, I'm an intellect. So, um, am I that? Now you know very well. Apply those three rules. Does it change? Does intellect change? Yes, it does. I hope it does. That's how we learn. <laughs> I did not know, now I know. I did not understand, now I understand. Therefore, the intellect changes. That's what we are interested in. Does it change? Yes, it changes. I was the one who did not understand. I am the one who understood. In that case, the intellect which did not understand it understood, it must be different from the I. It changed, but I am the same one. Is it something that we are aware of the intellect? Yes, I'm aware of not being able to understand. I'm aware of the delight in understanding uh, something, a mathematical or scientific problem, whatever it is, making a breakthrough, getting it, you know? So in that case, the intellect is something that is drishya, an object of awareness. And same principle applies. I am aware the intellect is not aware. Is the intellect aware of me, or am I aware of the intellect? I'm aware of the intellect. Consciousness is on my side, not on the side of the intellect. There are very subtle distinctions. Therefore, the intellect is also not the self. The intellect also becomes a sheath. Anyantaratma yeah. anandamaya. The intellect is not the self. The self is something inner. Now, remember what we are all doing. Don't lose track of what we are doing here. Why are we doing all this? We are inquiring into what am I? Where did we start? Long, long time ago, Sri Ramakrishna said, which one am I? Hands or feet or skin and blood? And From there we have started. We have come all the way inwards into the intellect. The intellect too is not what I am. It's there. Mind is there, intellect is there, the pranic body is there, the physical body is there, but I am none of these. These are like sheaths covering me, subtler and subtler sheaths enclosing me. That's the model which is being uh, built up, and 
it's all all wrong actually it's all false they are, they are pulling a fast one on us <laughs> they will as we go deeper it, they'll finally the upanishad will pull the rug out from underneath our feet so that's the amazing way of teaching in the upanishads i am not the intellect either if you push further than that if you try it further than deeper uh, beyond thought no thought allowed no understanding allowed nothing what do you get nothing is what you get blank you will hit a blankness a blankness which is most vivid in deep sleep this has a technical name in vedanta it is called the anandamaya the sheath of bliss for certain reasons uh, it's the cause it's also called the causal body um, again for certain reasons i remember there was one uh, senior swami in the ashram where i joined in deoghar vidyadhar maharaj is a wonderful old swami very austere uh, very non dualistic i remember as a brahmachari walking with him once in the in the grounds of that ashram it was about 25 years ago i still remember vividly and he used to stammer a little he was telling me about this process i didn't understand at that time he was telling me about drig drishya viveka the process of drig drishya viveka i still remember him looking up at me and with those big bright shining eyes he was shorter than me and he says beyond beyond the uh, beyond thought beyond uh, buddhi beyond understanding i said beyond that is blank what's there there's nothing i don't feel the existence of anything beyond that just blank and then with the big bright eyes and with a stammer he said um oy 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 andhkarer pare je ache take dhoro there 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 that beyond that darkness behind that darkness the one who is there catch hold of that one catch hold of that one of course you cannot catch hold of it but he meant it what he meant was uh, to grasp to in understanding notice how grasping means understanding in um, in sanskrit in uh, bengali in indian languages in english also uh, grasp dharo he means in the sense of understanding understand that one to be the self of course i didn't know at that time what he meant by that beyond the darkness of the uh, causal body so that one does that change well we do seem to come out of waking into deep sleep and from deep sleep back to waking um according to vedanta there is change in the causal body in the in the state of uh, agyana the three gunas sattva rajas tamas they keep changing and they're con- constant in constant flux and there are certain reasons why we we will say there is change in deep sleep uh, in the causal body itself not only that this much is clear is it something that we are aware of yes that's why we can speak of deep sleep that's why we can speak after we st- mind starts functioning we can say that oh i was not thinking of anything what were you thinking of nothing uh, so we are aware of think- seeing uh, of of thinking of nothing just like we are aware of seeing we are aware of seeing nothing also close your eyes so it's an object and is it aware of course not we may be said to be aware of it it's not aware of us svikaratvat drishyatvat jaratvat even the anandamaya is not the self ah oh, now we are getting close i'm sure you're going to tell us what the self is now and the upanishad keeps quiet <laughs> that's it sri ramakrishna says peel the onion find the onion peel 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 and then nothing <laughs> where is the onion where is the core we have promised like a you know like a nesting doll you go and we'll finally find the the, the tiniest doll enclosed within all the other dolls so we have this model which is set up on purpose in our minds are the five sheets and the atman the real self i the real i which vedanta is going to tell us about and i will discover brahman why because you promised when i know myself i will know god and when i know god everything will be fulfilled everything will be fine all uh, desires fulfilled huh? christmas shopping list all ticked all boxes ticked but now after going through these five stages five you know subtler and subtler inward and inward then quite none of them are the self the um, annamaya not the self food sheet but apranamaya not the self the manomaya not the self vigyanamaya not the self and the anandamaya not the self neither the physical body not the vital body not the mental body not the intellect nor even the causal the, the sheet of ignorance none of them whatever we experience you no know, when i say i i am here inquire and we inquire whatever we found 
we see it, none of them can be I. Yeah. Then where am I? Then I don't exist. And the Upanishad says, yeah. Uh, it says, the next thing the Upanishad says, in Taitya Upanishad, if you go there, the next sentence says, uh, Asad Brahma Iti Veda Ched, then Brahma, Natman, all this you are talking about doesn't exist. Asan Neva Sabhavati, then you don't exist. But I feel I do exist. What are you? These things. But are, are you these things? We just saw you are not none of them. I'm none of them. Whatever I could think of, I'm none of them. Yet I do exist. Which one? Where am I? I won't go through the story of the 10th man. If you have heard my talks, you will know. This is where the story comes in. You know, those friends who crossed the river and they thought that their friend has drowned and they counted. They had been told there were 10 in the group. So they counted 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And they couldn't find the 10th one because obviously they were not counting themselves. And then a wise person comes and says, um, count, I will show you the 10th person. And they count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There's the tenth one. And the wise man takes his hand and turns it around. Dasha Mastuamasi, thou art the tenth. You are the tenth. So, oh, I am the tenth. I see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now the question is, why was he not able to find the tenth man? Well, because um, he was counting the others. He was not counting himself. But the deeper question is, why was he not counting himself? Think about that. Why was he not counting himself? Because he has a very good reason not to count himself. Because all the others he found outside. So by that logic, where is the first one? There. Second one? There. Third one? There. Ninth one? There. Therefore, tenth one should be there. Isn't there. Therefore, he's dead. But the tenth one, one of these is not like the others. <laughs> the tenth one is not like those nine. It is the subject which is experiencing all the other objects. Now, ap apply it. I'll give you the technique. You can try it sometime. It'll lead straight to enlightenment. At least it'll lead to some in something interesting, <laughs> if not enlightenment. <laughs> try it. Note physically the body, then the breath, then subtler inwards the mind, subtler inwards. And why subtler inwards? Why not stop there? Savikaratva, drishyatva, jaratva, because of these reasons, it cannot be the self. Subtler inwards, the intellect. Subtler inwards, blankness. From body to blankness, what is that which is experiencing all five? Hmm. And the way to try it is physically, try it in, in experience. Physical body, here's the body, annamaya. I am not it. Then, Take your attention to something subtler. <sighs> Breathe in and out. Pranamaya. I am not it. Inwards. Subtler. Thoughts and feelings. I can't point it. You have to look, look at it yourself. <laughs> Thoughts and feelings and emotions, memories. I am not it. Manomaya. Label it. And I am not it. Inwards and subtler. The faculty of understanding which we are using now. Vijnanamaya. I am not it. Inwards, subtler, you get a blankness, nothing. If you rigorously keep out all thinking, all remembering, all, you just think of a, a situation where there's no thinking. Then drop that thought, that blankness. I am not it. Then what am I? What is that which illumines and experiences all five? You have it. But you can never objectify it. Drigeva natu drishyate. That is what Sri Ramakrishna says, Sheshe jathake tai atma chaitanno. In the end, what remains over is pure consciousness. If you don't do it rigorously, what will happen is you'll end up with the mind. Uh, if you flush out everything that is mind and thought and understanding, then you'll end up. But, but how will you end up? Will you know the self? Will you know pure consciousness? No, you will not. But it will be an intuitive grasp. Sri Ramakrishna elsewhere says, bodhe bodhkara, consciousness illumining and re uh, revealing itself. Like you don't need another light to know that light. It is revealing itself and everything else. Similarly, you will come upon not something, thing within quotes. It's not a thing. It is our own inner reality. That is pure consciousness. That is immortal. The body is mortal. That is beyond sickness and health. It is the prana which is controlling sickness and health. That is beyond hunger and thirst. That is prana. 
that is beyond uh, misery and desire and uh, frustration, that is the mind. That is beyond comprehension and non-comprehension, that is the intellect. That is beyond deep sleep and waking, that is the causal body, anandamaya. Beyond all of that, not subject to birth and death, not subject to illness uh, um, or sickness, not subject to um, misery and frustration, uh, pleasure and pain, uh, remembering or forgetting, not subject to understanding, not understanding, but illumining all of this and making all these experiences possible. Without it, nothing is possible. Tameva bhanta manubhati sarvam. That shining, everything else shines. Tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati. By its light, your light, everything here is lit up. By your light, everything in life is lit up. You shining, everything in life shines afterwards. It makes everything possible, but it's never an object. That is who you are. Once you realize that, that itself is God, that itself is Brahman. Uh, one more thing needs to be added there. And he says, Jagat Mitha. So, okay, I realize that is consciousness. And of course, there is the mind and the prana and the body and the world. If you stay there, that is Sankhya. Uh, that is, uh, uh, the world is also real, consciousness is also real. But what Advaita says is, I will not go into this. I plan to go into greater depth in this. It'll take about half an hour. How do you reduce the world to pure consciousness? That's the real Advaita, where what we left behind, the physical body, pranic body, uh, the mental body, the intellect, and the uh, causal body, all of them are nothing but appearances in consciousness. Remember, first we distinguished between consciousness, not conscious. And the witness is different from that which is witnessed. Drashta is different from drishya. But, here is a subtle thing, the drishya, that which is experienced, that is not different from the drashta. You might say, how is that possible? If two things are different, this is different and this is different, how then, how can, if this is different from this, then how can this be not different from this? But it's possible. It's not like these two things, not consciousness and not consciousness, not like that. It is like water and wave, like gold and ornament, like clay and pot. The clay is different from the pot. Why? Because the clay can be clay without being a pot. But the pot is not different from the clay, because it can never exist without the clay. The water is different from the wave, but the wave is not different from the water. In the same way, what Advaita says is a big bombshell. Whatever you experience after having discovered yourself as pure consciousness, whatever is illumined by that pure consciousness, mind and prana and body and the world out there is not out there. It appears to consciousness, it appears in consciousness, and it is nothing other than consciousness. This is the meaning of Jagat Mitha. The world is an appearance in consciousness, the world is an appearance in you. Appearance means it is nothing other than you. Just as every bit of the wave is water, Every bit of the pot is clay. Every bit of the universe is you, the pure consciousness. After this, one more point and I'm done. Sri Ramakrishna says, the two kinds of I, duirakam ami The two kinds of I, um, aktapaka ami, one is the ripe ego, and aktakacha ami, there is an unripe ego. So what happens after this enlightenment? Go and disappear into a burst of light? No. Again, the world will appear, the body will appear, the prana will appear, the mind will appear, same body will appear, same mind will appear, same intellect will appear, and the ego also will appear. But now the ego will be transformed. What is, what is the difference now? He says, the ripe ego and the unripe ego. Well, here is where it's very, this collection is very interesting. Amar body, Amar ghar, Amar chele, egulo kacha ami. Unripe ego, my house, my child, all, the, all these things, my possessions, these are the unripe ego. Ar paka ami and the ripe ego, Amitar dash, Amitar shantan, I am the child of God, I am the servant of God. The God is the master, I am the servant. This seems a bit dualistic, devotional. 
this is what we normally get when we read the gospel. This is we, what we hear. But the interesting thing is what Swami Brahmananda has recorded. He says there are two modes to this ripe ego. One is the dualistic devotional mode. Lord is the master. I am the servant. And there, it can be non-dualistic uh, non also. There's an Advaita Bhakti, but we will not go into that. But the second mode of this ripe ego, this is what I want to end with. Ar ami nitto mukto gan sharup. I, the ego which has come up when you are again active back in the world again. But I, what am I? The I now refers to that eternal, free, pure consciousness which I found in all of this inquiry. I found it. I have discovered it. At least I've got some understanding, grasp of it. I am that. We started with I. What does the word I refer to? Bottle. I. That. Nitto mukto gan sharup. Eternal, free, pure consciousness. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Rupanamastu I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, Swami Vivekananda, Swami Brahmananda to bless us, bless us all that we may have this intuitive realization in this very life and be blessed. Do we have time for one or two questions? Yeah, because we have run out of time. Yeah, five minutes. Yeah, please raise your hands. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. But very precise. Uh, Swami. Tell your us your name and ask the question. Yeah, Balakrishna. Uh, two questions. When you are using the three different types of uh, analysis to see which, what is uh, uh, self versus not self. Yes. Uh, the first two seem a little bit more clear, especially in the earlier stages of our koshas. Uh, but awareness, I mean, at least the way I understood you were saying, because I'm aware, that's not aware. It seems like a very, um, because I'm aware, you know, that is not aware is the, seems to be the analysis. Because I'm aware and that is not aware. Yeah, uh, like it's a little difficult to say that that is not aware, un unlike the other two where we say, I'm the seer, so I'm, I can ah. clearly see the difference. But but do you know what what is meant by awareness? No, that's a, that's a confusion. But are you aware? <laughs> yeah, I can say I'm aware, but it unless you are what is called seems to be unless what you are what is called a philosophical zombie, you know, a zombie is a one looks like a human being, talks and walks like a human being, but there's nothing inside, and there's no light on inside. You are aware. All of us are, without any doubt. Yes. That's the fundamental fact of our lives. Um, awareness, consciousness. This is the fundamental fact of our lives. Now, whatever we are aware of is an object to awareness. You might say, but I am seeing these people. Mm. Are these people not aware? I'm aware, I'm sure. I know I'm aware. But these people are also aware. But these people are aware, their awareness is not an object to your awareness. Their bodies, behavior, speech, activities are objects which you are aware of. Yes, if you were a telepath, you'd be aware of their thoughts, but you'd never be aware of awareness. I, I awareness agree. never becomes an object. Therefore, whatever is an object cannot be awareness. If I am aware, this is not aware, it's an object, it, then I must be different from this. Yeah, That's the logic. Uh, the second part of my question is uh, that the last Anandamaya Kosha is a little difficult to understand because intellect changing and like we are aware of it or, or, or we, are un we understand it, we don't understand it, that part is a little clear. But when you go to Anandamaya Kosha, that there is no change. I mean, I, I did not fully understand the analysis on the Anandamaya Kosha. Take it this way. The change in, change in the aware, uh, Anandamaya Kosha is, uh, is a subtle matter. And there are some speculations about it. But you need not go use that. Just use object, drishya and drashta, or use uh, uh, chetana and jada. Because it is insentient, and I am aware of it. Because I am the subject, and it is an object. Therefore, I cannot be the Anandamaya Kosha. Yeah, the awareness of that, it seems like it's like a on and off, like I'm aware, I'm not aware. That's the yes. only two sensations. The, the reason, to be the reason because why it's like that is because we are not, we are still at this point unable to distinguish very clearly between mind and consciousness. So in Anandamaya Kosha, in deep sleep, for example, the mind is resolved. It is not functioning. 
Therefore, we have a doubt. Am I really aware of the Anandamaya Kosha? Or am I not aware at all? Yeah. This question of whether there's consciousness at all in deep sleep or not. For example, modern neuroscience says that, uh, okay, you're limited to one. You have already asked three questions earlier, <laughs> before the class. <laughs> Arvind. Swami, uh, in the deep sleep, yes. that to whom the, or the, that which is aware of the blankness, mm. isn't that awareness itself in this isn't that isn't that brahman or the pure witness yes by the same logic that which is aware of the dream mm. and that which is aware of this entire world yes isn't that brahman and of isn't course that, I? that is the whole idea of the turiya um, uh, the so-called fourth which okay. the one consciousness illumining waking dreaming and deep sleep yes Yes, the young gentleman here. Tell us your name and ask the question. Swamiji, Samir Malhotra. I have so many questions, so I don't think I can ask you <laughs> all the questions. So is there one book you can recommend which awakens, which helps us uh, get to a better level of understanding? In this? I mean, the best book would be something like, well, would be the Mandukya Upanishad with the Mandukya Karikas. Um, but so is Ashtavakra. So it, if you want an understanding with the help of arguments and reasoning, then I would recommend um, some of the Prakarana Granthas first. I generally like uh, Drigdrishya Viveka, Aparoksha Nubhuti. And those Prakarana Granthas are short and easy and interesting. And then you go into the uh, Mandukya. Tell us your name and ask the question. Pranam Swamiji, I'm Gautam. Uh, uh, is the concept of a priori the same as an object? A priori in the sense, in the Kantian sense? Yeah, uh, in the Kantian sense, from a Western philosophical sense. Um, an object is that which is presented to consciousness hmm. from our, our perspective. Now, a priori, that's a different thing. That's a matter of uh, knowledge, a right. priori and a posteriori. Right? Mm. Um, so that is more epistemological than uh, ontological. Yeah. So we'll leave it at that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Shami. Yes. Hi, Swami. My name is Theo. Um, Theo. I'm an actor. Yes. And um, I've been studying Vedanta for a few years now. Yes. And um, as I go through the process of self-inquiry, um, so in my work, I use my imagination uh, predominantly. Yes. And something that I always am intrigued by or curious about is where the imagination resides within the five sheets. Mm. Is it? It seems to me somewhere between the um, mind and the intellect. Right. And furthermore, when I'm using my imagination in the context of my art, it's not something I'm doing consciously in the sense that the imagination is taking its own role and I'm following it in a sense. So I'm curious to know what what is where is the the imagination located in the context of the five sheets All right. and All right. Um, two things here. One is the imagination, you can say it's located in uh, the mind, in the manomaya, kalpana. Um, but more Im important than that, where the imagination is located, you can, it depends on how you classify it. But more important than that, you said something just now, I don't know if you noticed. I don't use the imagination consciously. See, that is the precise use of the word consciously that I want to, that Vedanta is attacking. By consciously, you mean deliberately self-consciously. But when the imagination is going on and you are <laughs> acting a particular role, you have thrown yourself into that role, have you become unconscious? Are you in coma? Are you not aware of anything? Not at all. You're still conscious. You're aware. So that background basic baseline awareness, the background radiance which reveals everything. When you are Theo, we know that. Um, and when you are acting as a particular character, that is also revealed to you. What you're saying is your mind goes on sort of uh, auto, you know, like, uh, so, 
So that's the mind. There is a lack of deliberation there. Now that actor and the role acted, that's a good example of what we are trying to say here. Consciousness is like being few. And uh, this person we are is like one of the roles you're acting. Uh, what we mean by consciousness, the Atman, how much effort do you put into being few? Nothing. How many dialogues do you have to memorize when I, this for my role? This is for my role as Theo. No. That is natural to you. It does not take any effort. If you put in it some effort, it will become inauthentic. You are not yourself then. You are yourself when you are yourself. Consciousness is itself without any effort. All effort, all intentionality in the Western philosophical sense is in the mind, not in consciousness. Hi, my yeah. name is Naina. Naina. I have a question. Is a consciousness and Atma and soul hmm. are the same? Uh, they are the same thing. Absolutely same thing. <laughs> okay. yeah. From an Advaitic perspective, they are the same thing. Okay. And what, what happens after a person dies? Oh, that's another part. <laughs> 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 um, but you can answer it yourself. We have already discussed five sheets. What dies when the, what is uh, beyond any doubt? What dies? Physical body dies. That is beyond any doubt. You're a medical doctor, you're an atheist, you're a Vedantin, whatever you are, you know that the physical body dies. Death is death of the physical body. What about the other four sheets, let alone the Atman? That's a question. Yes. Okay, a little bit relevant to her question. What's so your name? Shaili. Shaili. Uh, so we are the uh, Satchidan and the Swarupa, mm. and we are not these five sheets. Yes. So what happens, uh, what goes from one word to another, and how do we get out of this cycle? What goes from? Word to another, from one word to another. Okay, so this is related to that. And yeah. how do we get out of it? Yes, so in the Vedantic perspective, what goes from, or on entire Indian philosophical perspective, except the materialist Charvaka, uh, all of them, they say, mm -hmm. it is the physical body that dies. But the other four, they continue. There is no, uh, no evidence to show that they end with the death of the physical body. So that continues. That was not born uh, with the birth of the physical body. That does not die with the death of the physical body. So that continues. There, it's good that we have the terminology down now. So other than the Annamaya, Pranamaya, Manomaya, Vijnanamaya, these three together are called the Sukshma Sharira, subtle body. The Anandamaya is called the causal body. Causal body, subtle body continues after death. It is what travels from body to body. And consciousness reflected in it is the sentient being, the jiva, which we feel, the limited being. But you, the real consciousness, the, the witness of all of this, you don't actually travel from body to body. There's no traveling. It all occurs or it appears in you, the reality. You, are, you experience it. Right. How do we get out of it? <laughs> you get out of it by enlightenment, by realization. Uh, so this entire process of realizing yourself, when I realize I am this pure consciousness, I am the Atman, I am the consciousness in which this entire drama is playing, I've al I'm already out of it. Was I ever born as a, as a uh, body? No. It's like a movie screen on which, um, like, a terrible tragedy is playing. Now, if the movie screen asks, how do I get stop, put a stop to this tragedy? It's so sad. How can I get out of this? Well, one answer might be, wait for a while, the movie will be over, then you'll have a comedy. Mm -hmm. Then you ask, how do I get out of this round of tragedies and comedies? The answer will be, oh, you have to stop um, playing movies. But the Vedantic answer is, you're always out of it. What's your problem? You are a movie screen, you enable the tragedies and comedies to be played, they are not real. You are, even when the tragedy is playing, there's nothing that has happened to you, you are perfectly safe. Even when a comedy is playing, there's nothing really that has happened, you are perfectly safe. So upon enlightenment, from an Advaitic perspective, what happens is, do we realize, I was trapped in this terrible cycle of births and deaths, now I am free, no more is birth and death for me. That's what it seems like, that's the story from our perspective. From the enlightened person's perspective is, I was never trapped in this cycle of birth and death. Never was I born, never did I die, never, never was I caught in the trap of karma, always free. What Sri Ramakrishna says, 
আমি সেই নিত্য মুক্ত জ্ঞান স্বরূপ আই এম দ্যাট ইটার্নালি ফ্রি পিওর কনসিয়াসনেস ইউ সে দ্যাট এগেইন অ্যান্ড এগেন আই এম দ্য ইটার্নালি ফ্রি পিওর কনসিয়াসনেস আই আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড দ্যাট সো আমি বাট ওয়েন উইল আই বি ফ্রি হোয়াট ডিড ইউ জাস্ট সে ইটার্নালি ফ্রি নো বাট ইয়েস বাট ওয়েন উইল আই বি ফ্রি সো ফ্রম অদ্বৈত অদ্বৈত ইজ ভেরি ইন্টারেস্টিং ফিলোসফি all the other philosophers they will say yes you were bound and by this event enlightenment god's grace samadhi something you will be free there was bondage there is freedom we say what doesn't advaita then deny the whole thing it does that's why the mandukya karika is ultimately uh, there is no beginning there is no cessation and there is no one who is in bondage no one who is free there is no one who is seeking freedom no one even practicing spiritual disciplines you might say ah i am that one doesn't practice spiritual disciplines <laughs> and this is the ultimate truth na nirodhana chutpatti na baddho na cha sadaka na mumukshu na vai mukta ittesha paramarthata this is the ultimate truth what a strange it seems like a take down of all that we know as spirituality and religion but that's the um, the final vision that's the ultimate perspective i think we can end at this ultimate perspective oh uh, yes hi swami ji uh, my name is kiran yes. and my question is Uh, during the talk i felt like i logically understood yes. your progression but yes. then my doubt is still uh what if all of this is goes away when you die and it's just a process that's generated by the brain right it could be yeah. now that's the um that's the uh whole question today of what is consciousness a process generated by the brain look at what you are saying in that case you are saying that that what we are is brain and nervous system a system of living matter basically the annamaya with the physiological processes going on there so is that fundamental what is fundamental vedanta says consciousness is fundamental matter appears in consciousness matter is ultimately not distinct from consciousness um the materialist reductionist and modern science mainstream science and physiology says matter is real and therefore living matter is real and in living matter somehow the brain produces consciousness and this person you think you are when the body disintegrates the brain dies with it and nervous system perishes and that's the end of consciousness the end of the person there's nothing more that was known as the lokayata or charvaka view in ancient india when you say what's wrong with it what's wrong with it is this you have just have to google hard problem of consciousness it we are at a very interesting time in consciousness studies that uh, we are asking how is it that the brain generates consciousness where does it where does electrical activity subtle electrical activity in the neurons of the brain in the synapses where does it become mind and consciousness forget our vedantic idea of consciousness and all of this take a simple thing nobody doubts no scientist hardcore reductionist also doesn't doubt that we have thoughts i am thinking 2 plus 2 is 4 catch that thought see there's a devastating um, i would say a fault line far deeper far more dangerous than the great fault line in california yeah. it's devastating what is the devastating fault line something that is so pervasive in our lives as thought feeling emotion has actually no uh, place in science we shouldn't be thinking objects we should only be objects then scientists will be happy it fits the scientific world view but what is a thought you say oh that's that's a firing in the neuron but where is the neuron and firing of the neuron and the thought that i experience this gap there, there is no nothing in the universe which has two states an external state and an internal state which we are saying that the brain has brain has two states an external state which you is public which you can scan and find out you can watch in your fmri machines and an internal state which the person is feeling but no object like that in the universe there's no nothing known in science which ever does that so what is the connection between the brain's activities and consciousness now the uh, verdict is out jury is out on it that's the phrase the jury is out on it we don't know and the hard problem of consciousness david chamas who is there in new york in the mind brain uh, consciousness unit so he is the one who coined the term the hard problem of consciousness and he says not only do we not know we have, don't have the faintest clue though there are a lot of theories about it now but if you look at it from a vedantic perspective none of them even comes close to solving it uh, 
Why? Use that simple, uh, elegant knife I provided you with. If any theory of consciousness has an element of this, discard it immediately. Because it's not talking about consciousness. It's talking about an object. This neuronal activity, gone. You haven't heard it out. Uh, I don't need to hear it out. <laughs> you cannot make the jump from an object to the subject. You cannot. You cannot make the jump. They are not on the same plane of reality at all. It's like trying to make a jump between the illusory snake to the actual rope. You can't. They are not on the same plane of reality at all. Uh, so it cannot be done. I know one uh, neuroscientist was in anger. He is saying that, oh, you don't want a solution. You th it seems to me that the hard problem of consciousness is there to be revered, not to be solved. <laughs> but you, are not, uh, you don't understand. In principle, you are making a mistake. If you can say this, complexity, in uh, ITT theory is now being floated. Uh, complexity is the source of uh, consciousness. This complexity, gone, finished. Mm -hmm. This. <laughs> All right, so we leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you. You are supposed to be at the YouTube Swami, as you were introduced. Now we know who the YouTube audience is. <laughs> so thank you very much for this wonderful exposition of this five sheets, uh, which is one of the fundamental teachings of Vedanta. And, uh, and what a long kind of discourse we had on one small question put by the questioner to Sri Ramakrishna. Tell me in one word. <laughs> and uh, yeah, one and a half hour. <laughs> in fact, I remember one person comes to me and says, tell me in one word how to realize God. <laughs> and I was in Mayavati, that's in the Himalayas. I looked at him and said, in one word? He said, just one word. I said, practice. <laughs> <laughs> and I stopped there. I, didn't know, I never had to continue. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, thank you very much for being here. And like I said, like, Swami also emphasized, it just needs practice. Okay, so self-inquiry and all this practice. So, so we are thankful for him to be here and for the last uh, two weeks and enlightening us, regaling us with his presence. And uh, his next, uh, Mm. Talk is in uh, Santa Barbara. Two days, I can continue. So we also like to thank Swami Sarvadevananda Ji uh, for organizing all these things so that you all can be here. And he was specific. Don't let anyone stay outside. Bring them all in mm -hmm. so they can get enlightened. Mm -hmm. So like I end with practice. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. <coughs> that we thank, after thanks, everything. <laughs> 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 I want to say that we wish you that you will be more coming in person, but sorry, we could not accommodate many of our devotees who feel bad, who wanted very several phone calls and can I come, can I do uh, so uh, we feel for them that we could not accommodate them but we also feel bad that those who have signed up and didn't appear mm -hmm. 
depriving those earnest people. So I really, both the days I have observed. So I feel a little bit sad for that. But this is the way it works. <laughs> 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 and you have come, and I wish that you should continue. Vedanta is not ended in one day. It is lifelong practice. And what Panchakosa, this is going on from time it, it, uh, eternal. <laughs> yeah? Immortal time is going on and always analyzing, analyzing, analyzing. That's will be our constant sadhana. Thank you all for coming. And sorry we could not entertain you with anything. And it will continue for anything some time. More, <laughs> more with, <laughs> with some tea or something, snacks, nothing. And we'll continue like that. So for the time being till the situation improves. We are waiting for that. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Swami.